Welcome back to, uh, to Podcast Recovery. We are your hosts, David O. And Eric V. Today we are joined by Cindy. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? Doing well. Good. Doing well. Okay. Uh, where are you from? Uh, I am from the Fort Worth, Texas area. Okay. All right. Nice. And I, I grew up in Massachusetts. I'm a transplant. Oh, okay. Yeah, that must have been a big change. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> All right, um, I like it better down here. Oh yeah, a lot warmer, probably. A lot, <laughs> yeah. yeah, more tornadoes though, but you know. Yes, good. there is that, but <laughs> luckily I haven't seen one yet. <laughs> That's good. Um, when were you first introduced to recovery? When was I first introduced to recovery? Um, I guess I was about twenty-one years old. All right, and uh, how long have you been sober? I've been sober for um, about eight and a half years almost. Nice. Congratulations. So I got sober at 39, so it took me a little while from when I got introduced to when I got sober. Yeah. Yep. Definitely a couple tries for a lot of us. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's that's awesome. Glad to hear that. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you to share your story with us. So take it away. Okay. Um, So... I started drinking pretty early on. Mm -hmm. Um, I really remember starting to drink around the age of 12, I guess. Mm. Um, I I grew up in a household where um, drinking to excess wasn't really frowned upon. Yeah. So I didn't realize for a long time that that wasn't normal. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what your first Um, drink was? um, Well, it's funny. I sort of joke about that a little bit because... um, my parents were of the school that, like, if your kid had a cold, it was okay to give them a shot of whiskey oh. to help with the cough. Yeah. So, I mean, I I distinctly remember being, like, seven years old and drinking a shot of coffee brandy. Wow. Um, yeah, it was, just, it was normal. Yeah. So, yeah, it was. Um, yeah. Hmm. So, and then I just remember, I remember being 12 years old and all of us, you know, like, five of us going in on a bottle of peppermint schnapps. Yeah. And mm-hmm. then, like, standing behind the building before a school dance, fighting over who got to drink more of it, drinking it straight out of the bottle. Oh. Ugh. And uh, then I remember being 14 and drinking Bacardi 151 with my friends playing some card game. That did not end out well. I passed no. Out. No, it did not. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've drank to excess from the beginning. That's what I realized. Yeah. And I also was a blackout drinker from the beginning. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I drank through high school, but just at parties and stuff like that. I was a really good student. Mm-hmm. I got an academic scholarship to go to college. Um, it was a local college, but, you know, I graduated. I graduated with good grades. I got my scholarship. Mm-hmm. I didn't really have lots of consequences. Um you know, here and there, but I sort of seem to just get away with stuff. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it, it interfered with relationships more than it interfered with, like, any hardcore consequences. Yeah. Um, but when I was 21, a friend of mine said, I am not drinking with you again. Like, I'm done drinking with you. It's over. Um, wow. And it was because we had been in a bar together, and I disappeared for, like, an hour. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he was just tired of drinking with me and me just kind of disappearing. So, um, I went to my first AA meeting then, and I will say at the time, and this was up in Massachusetts, it was, you know, it was all guys. They were older guys. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I wasn't ready and I didn't see anyone who looked like me. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that, that just wasn't it. So, Mm -hmm. um, I ended up in a relationship with somebody kind of in my mid twenties that lasted for about four years. Mm-hmm. Um, my drinking was definitely something that got in the way of that relationship. Yeah. Um, there was kind of like, he had a limit. So whenever we were going anywhere, I was allowed three drinks. And after that, then, you know, I was mm-hmm. on my own. Uh. So I remember he broke up with me in a bar. And when he broke up with me, I said, well, now I'm having more than three drinks. Yeah. Which is kind of not the right response at the end of a four-year relationship. I see that now. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when we broke up, I tried 12 steps again. Um, I got sober for, I guess, about 30 days. 
I felt really good, whatever. And then a friend of mine convinced me that you get so many drinking days in your life, and I just was using mine too quickly. Oh, and wow. so if I could just learn to spread them out, <laughs> I would be okay. <laughs> so, um, oh, and I forgot, in the, in the middle of that four-year relationship, I went and lived in Ireland for a year, and we did a long-distance relationship while I got my master's degree. Oh, I'm sure, I, um, I'm sure Ireland was, is great for a binge drinker. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I drank a lot there. I was not faithful to that relationship. I'm not proud of that. It's just fact. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I, I missed out. I think about it now, and I realize that, you know, the one thing drinking does is it makes your world so small. Mm. And so I was there in Ireland for a whole year, and I could have seen the whole country, and instead I was drinking. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I still saw lots of cool stuff, and I did do some traveling, but I could have done so much more if I had not been doing that. Yeah. So, um, all this time I was working as a human resources manager for different companies, doing really well, not having consequences at work, moving my way up the corporate ladder. Mm -hmm. I had moved from Massachusetts to Connecticut and then from Connecticut um, to Rhode Island to a a bigger company, bigger job, more responsibility. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, everywhere I moved, there I was. Yeah, of course. So, um, when I moved to Rhode Island, I made friends with some folks who then... uh, I got introduced to cocaine Mm. and I was smoking it by the time I left there and I moved because that scared me more than my drinking. Yeah. Like I could, it it was like one of those things where I had to remove, I knew I had to physically remove myself. Mm. So I moved to Texas. Um, I sold everything I had just about. I had no job to go to. I had just come down here on business once or twice, met a couple of people, seemed like a good idea. And Mm -hmm. so I moved. Um, and then of course I was still here. (laughs) Yeah. Um, for the first, I guess, two years I was here or a year that I was here, I just worked temp jobs and worked in restaurants. Uh I didn't want to go back to HR. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Yeah. I tried taking classes, but hangovers really interfered with that. Oh yeah. Um, so I got a temp job and I ended up meeting my now husband. And um, he's a normie. Yep. He had no idea what he was getting into. Mm-hmm. So we got married in 2007. We had our daughter in 2008. Um, for some bizarre reason, in 2007, after we got married, we also bought a small bar together. Hmm. Hmm. That is not something you should do as an alcoholic. <laughs> no. I don't, I, I, don't, I don't think that's, uh, that's wise. No. It wasn't, it wasn't good for me. It wasn't good for our marriage. Somehow we survived it. Mm-hmm. Um, and we sold it about four months after I got sober. Nice. Um, but my drinking caused lots of problems um, in our marriage. Um, God, I was just an asshole. Yeah. Um, but I was a blackout drinker. And so I really, the, you know, the thing that I don't miss more than anything is that I don't have to wake up and wonder what I did last night or what I said. It was always what I said. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm genu- generally a, a person who is not very mean spirited, mm-hmm. but my drinking in the last, I'd say the last three years of my drinking, maybe four. And there were some times where I would drink just a little bit too much and I was just hell on wheels. I was angry. I would yell at people. I would say nasty things. Mm-hmm. And it was like all this stuff I was trying to get away from would come out while I was drinking. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't miss that at all. Yeah. Um, so I guess in 2009, I went back to 12 Steps. Mm-hmm. And I tried again. And I got 90 days, I think. Mm-hmm. And then I decided that I needed a relapse to really get sober. <laughs> huh. <laughs> I made a step I made a step one A where there's a relapse. So uh, okay. you know, I kept hearing people talk about relapses and I was like, Yeah, you know, I need one of those. Wow. So um, yeah. I, I mean I, I remember thinking like, Oh, I you know, maybe you're supposed to have that, not realizing I had already had several mm. years of that. Yeah. But, so I went to a liquor store. I bought a small bottle of Kahlua. Mm. I went to Starbucks and got a black iced coffee, drank half the coffee, put the Kahlua into it, and went to a a 12-step meeting with my Kahlua coffee. 
Nice. And I remember my sponsor at the time was looking at me going, is everything okay? And I was like, yeah, I'm fine, right? Mm -hmm. Because clearly she knew what was going on, but she needed me to admit it, and that wasn't happening. Yeah. So um, I went back out. I told my husband that my sponsor said if I had relapsed, then I could go ahead and just drink that night as long as I, you know, got back on the saddle the next day. Did your sponsor actually say that? No. No. (laughs) Okay. I was like, wait a minute. Hold on. (laughs) Just had to ask that. All right. No. No. So um, that was that. And then I think I went back. This is the part where I get a little bit fuzzy because it kind of was all happening so fast. Mm -hmm. And every time I drank, it was a blackout. Yeah. Um, But in the spring of 2010, my husband who was my age, so we were both 38 at the time, mm-hmm. had a heart attack. Oh, wow. And, yeah, and it was the Widowmaker, but he survived it. Oh. And so um, I didn't really deal with that well. I didn't have coping mechanisms. I realize that now. And so I ended up drinking again because I was just, I didn't drink, like, right after it. It was, like, two months later. No, I guess it was six months later. Mm-hmm. I was off the deep end. And so what ended up happening is um, I found myself uh, trying to have a relationship with someone other than my husband. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I, on some level, was thinking, I'm just, I'm just going to have you get rid of me before you leave me, however you leave me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was in our bar one night. I was drinking, and I don't remember any of this, but I know that I got a simple assault ticket because... Apparently, my skirt had gone up, and a guy in the bar tried to tell me that, and my thank you to him was to slap him really hard across the face. Oh, wow. Mm. And, wow. and so, he called the cops, and I got an assault ticket. Mm. Mm. Um, still don't remember it. Yeah. Um, I did, when I made my, tried to do all my amends, I did try to find him, because his name and his phone number were on my ticket, yeah. but I was not able to locate him, because really, he did me a favor. Mm-hmm. So, um, I was banned from my own bar. I couldn't be in there after four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, wow. That was like basically the, the deal with the, the regulators. That's got to be a, um, that's gotta be a first. <laughs> yeah, I'm like the Ron White of bar owners. I got thrown <laughs> out of my own bar. Um, so, so, I, um, you know, I started going to meetings and... I was so scared. I was, you know, I didn't do 90 and 90. I did like 120 and 90. Mm-hmm. I would I would go to a noon meeting. I'd go to a 8 o'clock meeting. I'd go to a, I was talking to people. If they asked me to go for coffee or lunch, I was going because I was just so scared. Mm-hmm. I didn't I didn't trust myself to, to not drink. And I thought the only way I could not drink was to just keep going to meetings. Yeah. Like that, that was literally what I thought. Mm-hmm. Um. And so I did that. And for a while, like one of the old timers, one of the guys pulled me aside and he was like, you need somebody to just keep an eye on you for a little while. So until you find a woman to sponsor you, you're going to answer to me. Hmm. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Um, So he kind of kept an eye on me for about my first 90 days. Mm -hmm. And then we ended up moving uh, when we were still in the bar. And so I had such a hard time trying to pick a sponsor. Like I just like, you know, I had, I I don't know. I just couldn't figure it out. Yeah. And so I went to a meeting one night and it was at a group that was super busy. I showed up for an eight o'clock meeting at night and no one showed up except for one other woman. Ah. And an hour later, after I had been talking to her for an hour, we realized no one else had showed up. And I was like, okay, so obviously this is uh, that higher power they're talking about. Mm-hmm. Will you be my sponsor? Because, <laughs> I mean, they couldn't have made it any easier for me. Yeah. Um, and she's still my sponsor. Nice. Yeah. And, I mean, we've moved around a little bit, and we live about an hour and a half away, depending on Dallas traffic. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, she's still the person that when I'm really, like, having a problem or whatever, I still call her, and she can call me on my shit, and I love her to death. Nice. So, I also, um, during that time, like, there was lots of things that just happened that shouldn't have happened. Like, I know it's higher power stuff. You know, mm-hmm. we found someone to buy the bar. 
um, which was a big deal. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was just a little shithole country bar, so it wasn't like, you know, everybody would want that. Yeah. Um, There was, I didn't talk in meetings a lot because I just, um, the guy who, who was kind of keeping an eye on me those first 90 days mm-hmm. said, you know, you need to just go to meetings and shut up and listen. Mm-hmm. You need to not talk because you don't have anything to say right now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because he had seen me in meetings earlier when I had tried to get sober before the relapses and was like, you know, you know the right things to say, but I don't think you're getting it. So stop talking. Yeah. Um, so he gave me like pages of the big book that I had to read every night for 30 days to get it through my thick head. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there was this meeting I went to and there was this adorable little old lady. She, her name was Mary. And she came up to me after a meeting and she said, you know, when I got sober, I didn't know if I wanted to keep my husband. And I decided that I was going to keep my husband because how could I tell my kids he was good enough for them and not good enough for me? Mm. And I was like... Okay. Mm -hmm. I couldn't understand how this woman knew that I was dealing with this struggle of like, what happens to my marriage? Do I try to fix it? Do I not try to fix it? And Mm -hmm. I had never spoken a meeting. I'd never said a word. Yeah. And she just randomly came up to me and said that. Hmm. Um, So I met lots of good people. Um, You know, I don't go to meetings as often as I should. I do a lot of online meetings now. Mm -hmm. Um. I've maintained continuous sobriety since then. I went back to school. I got my nursing degree. Nice. Um, so I work as a nurse, and uh, I'm still married to my husband. My daughter, our daughter is 11 now. Mm. Um, luckily, she's never seen me drunk. You know, she was wow. two. Um, and when, I guess when she was about six or seven years old, I explained to her that I was an alcoholic, you know, Mm -hmm. because at that point I needed to sort of take her to meetings with me sometimes just because of our schedule. And so I explained it to her and I was like, you know, mommy just has an allergy to alcohol. And she's like, well, what happens? And I was like, I make bad decisions. (laughs) Yeah. And, And she looked at me and she said, well, mommy, I'm sure that God forgives you because he knows that you have an allergy. Nice. (laughs) <laughs> Kids and are the I best. thought, wow, I have been trying to figure this out for how many years? And my five-year-old just explained it to me. Yeah. <laughs> just broke it down. Mm-hmm. And so that really helped me forgive myself for a lot of it. Um, and I think since then, I really, I don't beat myself up as much. I do find the longer that I'm sober, little snippets of those blackouts come back to me. Mm. And I remember things that I thought I had completely forgotten. And then I have to deal with those things when they come up. Um, and I don't know. I mean, there's lots of crazy stories that happened in those years. Oh, yeah. Crazy. Sure. Oh, yeah. But, <laughs> you know, it was. I, I. How much do you want to really remember that, though? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of it that I don't want to remember. Exactly. And I'm okay with yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, and it, you know, there was a time where it used to be fun and there was a time where, you know, the joke was people knew like, if you were going to go have a beer with me, you know, I didn't stop for a beer Yeah, we're having a minimum of three or four beers. I'm mm-hmm. not going out for just one. Yeah. Um, and, and you never knew what was going to happen. Mm-hmm. And in the beginning that was fun. And then later it wasn't. And mm-hmm. at the end it wasn't even fun for me ever at all. And I just never could understand why I couldn't just sort of stop. Like, why couldn't I just, you know, have a couple? And I just couldn't. Mm-hmm. It was like, once I started going, that was it. I was off to the races. Yep. Oh, yeah. Hmm. I guess that's sort of... That's sort of all of it. All right. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Yeah. That's great. Um, you want to start, Eric? I guess sure. So. I start I'll stay on this uh, blackout kind of uh, discussion. Um, I feel like I asked someone this recently, um, and it's kind of like uh, similar to, I remember I was in treatment one time, and there was someone who uh, was a gambling addict, and they asked, the, well, and they do this with like addiction as well, like how much you spend on drugs or alcohol, um, or like how much you spend on gambling. How long do you think you lived life in a blackout? Oh, wow. 
No, I, I have wondered about that because, I mean, I've read about the, like, the anatomy and the physiology of the blackout mm-hmm. and the fact that you just drink so much alcohol so fast that you overwhelm your, your hippocampus, I think it is, mm-hmm. and it just can't form short-term memory. Mm-hmm. What I have found that is um, frustrating sometimes is that there's shit from times where I wasn't drinking that I just can't remember. Mm. And so I think it has clouded years where there's stuff that, you know, people will talk to me about. And I know it's from a time that I wasn't even like drunk in those moments, but I can't remember. Like I honest to God can't remember. Yeah. Hmm. So, I mean, my first blackout that I remember, I was 14. Mm. And my last blackout that I know about, I was 39. So there's 25 years of off and on blackout drinking. Mm. That's a long time. Yeah. So would you um, consider yourself a binge drinker? Oh, definitely. Because I, I, didn't, I didn't drink daily. Mm-hmm. That was the crazy part is like, I mean, I could have periods where I was like, okay, like I really need to lay off, whatever. Um, but... It, it always, like, when I would start drinking, then I would drink a lot, mm-hmm. you know. And I remember in my early 30s, before I moved down here, you know, I dated somebody who was about uh, 18 years older than I was. And he was a big drinker. Like, that was sort of the attraction, right? Mm-hmm. And even he was like, you're going to need to slow down. Yeah. <laughs> like, if we go have a drink, you're going to have to slow down. It was just that feeling, mm-hmm. that absolute abandon and comfort and just feeling like I could do anything. And then, you know, I just, I really enjoyed that Mm -hmm. until I didn't. Yeah. (laughs) Um, All right. Um, So so what was sort of like, I think, hmm, go ahead. I I think the other thing with the the blackouts that's frustrating is that I have learned, like when, when I talk to people I haven't talked to in a long time, um, I always don't know exactly what I'm going to get. Mm-hmm. because I don't know if the last time I saw them, was I drinking? Was there a blackout? What did I say? What did I do? Yeah. And so there have been times where like, I'll call somebody and I'll be like, Hey, and they're like, Hey, do you remember the last time you called me? And I've learned to stop lying because when I say, Oh yeah, sure I do. And then they tell me what I said. I'm like, Oh fuck. Yeah. No, oh. I don't remember that. <laughs> oh, wow. So I don't lie about remembering anymore. Yeah. That's probably, probably for the best. <laughs> um, yeah. All right, I got a question, uh, sort of about like uh, the beginning of your your drinking. Um, w- were there any like other? What were like the motivating factors of you starting to drink? Was it like curiosity? Was it like a peer pressure thing, or, or did you just see that it was it, it seemed socially acceptable, uh, acceptable, and so you just did it, or was there any anything more there? I, I think in the beginning it was just a socially acceptable thing. It was, mm-hmm. I mean, I, every family party, I come from a long line of Irish alcoholics. Yeah. So, um, That's every my- family party there was drinking. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my parents had, this always makes people laugh. My parents had a full bar in the basement mm-hmm. that was made out of a church pew. Oh, when wow. our church was yes. um, when our church was like redoing the inside and whatever, they sold off at a discount these church pews, and we had a bar in the basement that was made out of one. Wow, that couldn't so, be that couldn't be more Irish Catholic. <laughs> no, it really couldn't. Could it? S- serving again um, Guinness on a pew? That's genius. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, there was there was always. You know, everybody smoked and everybody drank, and that was just the way that it was. And Mm -hmm. so, I mean, I don't remember there being a barbecue that didn't have cold beer. I don't remember. Yeah. um, Oh, and my my parents had a kit. Um, It's sort of funny. I started taking uh, comedy classes as a hobby. Mm -hmm. And so so my parents had this kit that they drove around with in the trunk, and it was about the size of a shoebox maybe. And, you know, it looked like a miniature suitcase. Mm-hmm. And it basically fit a full-size bottle of whiskey, mm-hmm. two shot glasses, two rocks glasses, stirs, all that stuff, so that wherever they went, if they went to somebody's house, they didn't have to worry about whether or not they had their particular brand of whiskey. Oh, they just had it with them at all times. 
Wow. So I thought that was normal. Yeah. Um, you know, and my parents, you know, it's, it's not up to me to say whether or not they're alcoholic or they're not alcoholic. Mm-hmm. You know, to the best of my business, my opinion, yeah, they are. Yeah. But they were very high functioning. Mm-hmm. So they both held down jobs. They didn't lose their jobs over it. Um, you know, their relationships suffered mm-hmm. um, oh, with yeah. each other, with me, with other people. Um, but that was, that was just the norm. And so the girl that I got the bottle of peppermint schnapps with when I was 12, Mm -hmm. her parents and my parents, every Friday, they used to all get off of work early and they used to go to the bar and they would get there depending on who got off when they get there anytime from noon to two in the afternoon and they would stay there and drink until close. Wow. And so, and that was every Friday. And so... I think that was just what we thought was normal. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Um, and then at the time, it just seemed like every, I get, I'm sure it wasn't, but it seemed like so many kids my age were drinking. I mean, this was before zero tolerance. Yeah. This was before all of, all of that stuff. You know, this is the early 80s. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, do you want to go or can I follow up, Eric? You can follow up. Go I can ahead. follow up. All right. Go ahead. Um, you you just sort of like mentioned it. Um, the really like the functional addict mentality. Um, yeah. How does how does that become like a norm? Like in our in our own minds, like because I I had it as well. Like I thought I was like a functioning addict at one at one point. Um, so it, it's because it's really like a juxtaposition of. You're admitting <laughs> it really is like you're admitting you're an addict, but you're like, but I'm okay. I'm I'm a better addict than those other addicts, so I'm a functioning addict. So like, how how do we? How did you like rationalize that in your head to just sort of continue your your drinking, your addiction? God, I can I can remember like I can picture it so clearly sitting at this bar in Connecticut mm-hmm. and saying to someone like I know I'm an alcoholic, but I'm functioning so. Um, (laughs) It's just so stupid. So stupid. Mm -hmm. But I I think what it was is that somewhere in my head, I thought, well, okay, let's check the boxes, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Do I have a job? Absolutely. I had a job and I didn't lose my job over it. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I have an apartment. I'm paying my rent. I'm paying my bills. I mean, I was racking up credit card debt left and right, but I was keeping the house afloat. Mm -hmm. Um, I had a car. You know, I, so if you didn't scratch the surface, everything looked okay. Yeah. Yeah. But the minute you kind of peeked under the surface just a little bit, I think it was batshit crazy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I, I really think that's what it was. So I think it was just appearances. Yeah. And I, I think for a long time, those that didn't actually sit and drink with me, who never saw the the binge drinking or the bad decisions or just the craziness, Mm -hmm. I don't think they had any idea. Yeah. Mm. Until it got to a point where I couldn't manage it anymore. Yeah. Hmm. All right. What do you got, Eric? All right. So, um, okay. We'll ask this one. Uh, so there's a lot of different types of recovery. Um, Yep. Right, so there's different fellowships. Um, there's different ways to recover. Um, you know, I might I call myself an addict. You might call you call yourself an alcoholic. So like, there's different roads to this, and you know, those are just two different ones. But you know, there's we're vast and many. Um, what does recovery mean to you? Oh, that's a good question. It's a deep question. Um, so it has changed. That, that definition has evolved for me over time. So, you know, in the beginning, I think it was, I just didn't want to be drinking. Didn't want to hurt anymore. Mm -hmm. Like I just, you know, the thing I've said lots of times when I've, when I've told my story is, you know, I didn't necessarily you know, another check the boxes thing, right? Mm-hmm. There, there didn't come a point for me. And I always say, yeah, at the end of these sentences, but I, you know, I, I didn't lose my car. I didn't lose my house. I didn't get a DWI. I didn't go to jail. I didn't, you know, there was, I didn't do those things yet, mm-hmm. but I lost myself. 
I totally lost myself. I didn't know who I was without the alcohol, and I didn't know who I was with the alcohol anymore. I just didn't know who I was. Mm -hmm. So I just didn't want to feel like that anymore. So I think in the beginning it was just, just don't let me feel this way anymore. Don't let me feel so scared in my own skin that I don't know which way to turn. Yeah. And then beyond that, it was, okay, well, now what do I want to do with my life? Mm-hmm. You know, and and now, eight years in, I guess somewhere around year six or something, I started thinking more about really what I wanted as a person, who I wanted to be as a person, you know, who do I want to be when I grow up? Mm-hmm. God knows that when we start drinking, we just stop maturing. Yeah. So... You know, I tell people all the time I started at 12 and I've been eight years sober. So I'm about 20 now. It's the best <laughs> I can figure. Um, my body, my body doesn't agree, but I still go with 20. Mm-hmm. Um, so now it's what do I want from myself? What can I do? Um, you know, so I'm already doing my master's in nursing because I want to be a, a nursing professor. Nice. I've become very passionate about wellness. I've become passionate about wellness and recovery mm-hmm. because when I worked in the emergency room, I saw so many addicts and alcoholics who were just in those early stages of sobriety who had no idea why their body was fighting against them when they had finally decided to stop. Yeah. And that really struck me as like that's that huge area where people just don't realize it's like, it's like all the other shit, right? Just because you stop drinking doesn't mean your life stops being a mess. Yeah. Well, just because you stop drinking or doing drugs, your body doesn't stop being a mess either. It takes time. Mm-hmm. You have to heal yourself. Yes. And mm-hmm. so I guess I really, now recovery to me is like, it's, it's very holistic. Mm-hmm. I think it's, it's your body and your mind and your spirit. Mm-hmm. And I, I think it encompasses all those parts and where... I will never knock the fellowship that got me sober because Mm -hmm. if not for it, I don't sit here and tell this story. Yeah. It's now a piece of my recovery and not the end all be all. So, you know, I hear about refuge recovery and I, you know, listen to it and I take some pieces from it. Absolutely. Um, You know, there's another fellowship out there for, you know, the, the, adult children of people like me Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. I've started dabbling. I've started dabbling in that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I do online meetings um, that don't necessarily have a particular fellowship associated with them. Yeah. Because you can just learn so much from so many different directions that, God, I don't want to limit it to any one thing and miss out on something beautiful. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. You, you just hit the, like, that whole, that, that last couple minutes, like, once you said refuge recovery, my eyes got as big as saucers. And I was like, oh, my God, yes, this is exactly – we were just having this conversation, like, an hour ago. Um, and Because that's what we're all about here at Podcast Recovery. Like, and being able to the, – the more tools you have, like, the more equipped you are to, to battle addiction on any front. And uh, I love that you just said that. It was a fantastic answer. Absolutely. Like I, I didn't add meditation into my recovery routine until just the last year. Mm-hmm. It's a game changer. Oh yeah. It's a huge game changer. Mm-hmm. You know, I've started going to yoga because it just helps me. And so I, I realized that everything, everything is a piece of my recovery. And I've heard people call it patchwork recovery. And I really like that. Yeah. It's like, you know, I have my own tools of recovery and I put different squares on it and whatever works, that's awesome. And I don't ever want to close myself off to another square because it might reach a part of me that I didn't know I had to fix for lack of a better way to put it or open something up that I didn't even know was closed. Oh, you were, you were just speaking to my spirit right now. Thank you so much. Oh God. (laughs) Thank you so much. (laughs) Patchwork. uh, By the way, Eric and I, I'm pretty sure are both going to use the title. We're going to there. That's the title of your episode. hundred percent. But we're going to, we're going to definitely take uh, patchwork recovery from you. Oh, for sure. Um, Thank you. I don't know where I heard it, but I, you know, I, it's funny. I, I said to my husband sometime in the last month, I said, for me, it's an exciting time in recovery because mm-hmm. there's so many resources and yeah. there's so much online and there's so many podcasts and there's so much stuff. And, you know, I started listening to podcasts when I was in nursing school because the schedule was crazy. Yeah. And you know, I couldn't always make a meeting, but I could listen to a podcast in the car. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Absolutely. Um, and and it, there's just there's so much stuff out there. Like it excites me. I like it. Mm-hmm. I sort of want to stay on the uh, sort of like the medical clinical side of addiction for a second, because um, you talked yeah. you talked about how. Um, when we take the drugs out of our system, there's still a lot of like internal healing, and especially like with um, with a, a lot of drugs, it has to do do with like serotonin levels and and dopamine levels and yep. all and and really correcting that sort of like brain chemistry, which can take a long time to really like get back to a normal homeostasis. Yep. Um, so, what do you, what would you recommend from like a like a more clinical background or, or at least like a clinical education, f- what what really would help people in those like post-acute withdrawal sy- uh, like symptoms? Um, you know, I think it's a combination of things and I'm really just sort of speaking off of what I think without having evidence to back me up right now, which always scares me when I do that. But mm-hmm. um, I think it's a combination of things. You know, I I never realized the importance of exercise. Mm-hmm. And I don't mean like you got to be at the gym seven days a week doing an hour. I mean, take a walk. Yeah. <laughs> Let your body see the sun. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, just sort of spending time outside, letting your body take in things that it hasn't seen before, seeing the beauty of the sunrise. Mm-hmm. Um, I think nutrition is so critical and I think typically when we're in addiction actively whether it's alcohol or drugs we are not paying any attention to what it is that we're putting in our body I mean I remember I used to joke uh no I'm not having supper because it's going to get in the way of my buzz you know I I don't need to eat right now yeah um food was just extra calories uh, yeah yeah (laughs) and so you know I think there's that I think it's you know vitamins um, I will say I am a huge proponent of essential oils, which I know is strange for a nurse. No. But I'm a person who thinks it's not just all medicine. I, I think that there's another side to it. Mm-hmm. And I find on the morning that I put some essential oils in the diffuser while I'm meditating and getting my morning routine started, my day starts off better. Yep. And whether that is me just thinking it's so or it's really happening, I don't have to spend a lot of time wondering which one it is because it works. So why fuck with it? Exactly. Um you know, I do uh, I do a couple of rounds of Whole30 a year. I'm a Whole30 coach, mm-hmm. which is like a, it's a reset diet to figure out which foods are causing problems for you. Hmm. They can cause inflammation or, um, you know, there's a lot of studies that say that a lot of your emotional well-being is in your gut. And I will tell you that when I lay off the sugar, I agree with that. I feel better. Yeah. Um, because when I got sober, you know, it was an old timer. He said, get a bag of chocolate, stick it in the refrigerator. When you're having cravings, you eat chocolate. Well, that was great. I just transferred it to chocolate, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, which was better. You know, I'm not going to go get a DUI over too much chocolate. Yeah. Chocolate was, that was my first addiction. Oh, I still, still struggle. (laughs) Yeah. It probably was my first one before alcohol, but, Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it's just, it's looking at the pieces of how do I take care of myself? Yeah. Like that whole holistic thing of, um, if, you know, I think journaling is a huge part of recovery yep. and I don't, it doesn't have to be a novel. It doesn't have to be whatever. It just, you know, identifying what you're feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been reading this book, uh, letting go mm-hmm. that a, a friend of mine over, um, in the recovery revolution told me about. And it, <laughs> there was this part that he taught me about it because I wasn't that far in the book yet. Yeah. Like, if you fight getting angry, it will actually make you stay angry longer. Yeah. Whereas if you just let yourself have the emotion and deal with it, it'll go away faster. Mm. And that was, that was another thing that was life-changing for me. It was like, oh, okay. Um, you know, anything by Brene Brown has changed my life because I'm like, oh, okay. I'm not a bad person. I've just made some bad decisions along the way. Yeah. So... I, from a health perspective, I think it, you know, I, I joke that it takes a village with me. You know, it takes more than one kind of recovery program. It takes a therapist. Mm-hmm. It takes some essential oils. It takes a good diet. It takes some exercise. Um, but all those things play into it mm-hmm. um, and help me be a happier, more well-adjusted person. 
Nice. Over to you, Eric. Hopefully that was long of an answer. Oh, yeah, that was great. That was good. Um, okay, so I, I think I... I think I have a question. Um, I, I, I do this a lot. So uh, you were talking about after your husband um, had a heart attack. Um, yes. You were mentioning something about like, uh, you know, going outside of the like the marriage. Did you mention something yep. about that? Um, I did. I, yeah. you, you With kind a of, customer at our bar. Yeah, you kind of passed over it real quick. Um but I guess my question is, so obviously besides just the drinking and, um, you know, all that comes with that, you know, how do you work to repair your relationship once you get sober with your husband, um, you know, after, yeah, all, was, after all of that? That was a big one. Um, I... So I historically, as a person, was not necessarily the most faithful person. Mm -hmm. um, I, I realize now, in hindsight, that I just believed people were going to leave me or hurt me. And so I was just going to screw them over before they were going to screw me over. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, my, my parents had a very um, I guess explosive or... Uh, tempestuous relationship, you know, they, they, they would have battles that were just loud and angry. And my father was forever about to leave. You know, they, they were almost getting a divorce every, oh God, I, I, I probably lost count. And that started when I was young. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, and when my, when my father got upset with my mother, he wouldn't talk to me either. Oh, wow. So there would be times in our house where he would go, two weeks without talking to anybody in the house. Wow. And so I, I, I had no, um, I had no one to look up to for what a healthy relationship was supposed to be. Mm. And so, you know, then when I married my husband, I was like, you know, I really love my husband and my husband is a good man. Mm -hmm. And I know this. And we were doing okay. Everything was really going along and he had that heart attack. I think, you know, through therapy, what I have learned is that my only other experience with a heart attack was my grandmother, who was the only person who really had given me unconditional love, who I lost when I was 12 after she had a heart attack. Oh. So, it, and it was something I had never dealt with. And so it set off this thing in me that just between the drinking and having those childhood experiences, I was just going to leave him. I, I was going to create a situation where he could just leave me before it got any closer and before it got any more hurtful. I, I don't think I knew how to let him in mm. before. And then when I went to get sober, I was real adamant in the beginning and I, I don't know where this came from, but I was like, I have to get sober for me and I have to, I have to fix me. I have to work on me. Yeah. And, and I can't, I can't deal with like, I want to fix what we have, but you have to let me fix me first. Mm-hmm. And I don't even like saying fix me because, but, but, but I was broken, you know, yeah. and I needed to become more whole. Mm -hmm. So I will say he gave me that space. Mm. And so, and, and then we just worked on it. We went to, we went to counseling together, mm -hmm. um, which I was really, you know, it was really good for us. We worked through a lot of stuff. We figured stuff out. We were both committed to staying married. We had a child. We didn't want to be divorced. And somehow we made it through. And honestly, I mean, I feel like we have a good marriage. It's not a perfect marriage. I don't know that anyone has one. No. Mm -hmm. um, but I have never since gone outside my marriage, and I never would. Mm -hmm. Nice. And, you know, I try not to have regrets, but I do I do wish I had not done that to him. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, you, you spoke about how, like, when you were coming into the rooms, you had one of the old-timers who sort of yeah. um, told you to uh, open your ears and not your mouth so much. Um, yeah. And, and, like, I, I've heard a lot about that in recovery and, like, how uh, recovery back in the day used to be way more of, like, a tough love sort of um, uh, thing. Like, it, it was just... One of the yeah. one of the sayings here in Baltimore was just like work the work the steps or die, motherfucker, and like 
that w- that was just like an accepted thing, but now it just seems to have changed to like a more accommodating, compassionate, understanding um, uh, type of recovery. So where where do you see like there? Because I th- I think both are necessary. Do you agree? And like mm-hmm. where where do you see where they they meet? Uh, that's another interesting question. So I think maybe the reason it was so hardcore before mm-hmm. is that people's bottoms used to be a lot lower. Hmm. Um, you know, you don't you don't have to hit skid row, for lack of a better word, yeah. um, to get sober anymore. And I think for a long time, there was such a stigma around being an alcoholic or an addict that people hid the fact that they were as best they could. Mm. Or they ended up where they just had absolutely nothing. They had lost everything. Yeah. Um, it also, also, I mean, God, there. I remember. I, I mean, I've met people in meetings that have six DUIs. It you used to be able to get six DUIs. Yeah. It's not like it is now. Yeah. No. So, so there was there was almost more of an acceptance of some of the the craziness, mm-hmm. and that would bring you to a low that was lower. Okay. I, I think now there's, you know, your bottom can be a high bottom, mm-hmm. which means you're not going to respond well to some of the aggressive methods that used to happen. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're about to lose your house, you're about to go to jail, you've lost your kids, you've lost everything, you're going to listen to whatever anybody tells you to do because you're just trying to live. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, now your bottom's a little bit higher, you haven't lost anything per se you just don't want to lose anything you're not necessarily going to be into the aggressiveness Hmm. um i also think society has changed the shit Hmm. that you could say when i was a kid versus you can't say it oh yeah uh, most of it now oh i know um the methods just don't don't flow you know yeah but but i do think there's a place for both I do think that there are some of us, and I was one, Mm -hmm. who are fast talkers, and Mm -hmm. we learn well, and we hear what other people say, and we know how to imitate it in a meeting, but we're not getting it. Mm -hmm. And he saw that, and he saw, like, well, I've already seen you in here, and you said all the right shit, and you still fucked it up, so shut up. Yeah. And that was what I needed. Mm Mm-hmm. So, I still think there's a place for both. I think it's just harder now to use the harder one. Hmm. That's a great take on it. I didn't think about that. Yeah, that was great. What you got, Eric? Um, this will be my last question. Um, Ooh. Make it count. So, what does spirituality mean to you? Mm. That's something I've been kind of like wondering um, for different people recently. I actually looked up the definition um, after you know reading some stuff on you know, from other people and like hearing, you know, in meetings recently about what people believe spirituality means. Um, so I looked it up okay. to make sure that I understood what spirituality means, but I understand that it's different for everyone. So I'm, um, what is your interpretation of spirituality and what it means to you? Hmm. Another one that has evolved over time. Um, hmm. so I was, I, I used to associate spirituality just with church, mm-hmm. except I didn't. I didn't get it. I didn't get it when I was at church. So I was raised Catholic. I didn't understand it. I had lots of questions. Um, you know, my my parents went to church because that's what you were supposed to do. We mm-hmm. didn't really talk about it, and so well, I don't know. So when I turned eighteen, I stopped going to church, and that was it. Mm-hmm. And I went on my merry way. And I, I've always, you know, believed that there's a God. I'm not, you know, for me, it's an ego thing. There has to be someone greater than me. Mm-hmm. Um, what was nice for me is that when I did come into the 12 step fellowship, you know, one of the parts that I did, I think on step three was, you know, make a list of what you want your higher power to be. What are the qualities? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so then that whole creating my own version. In the end, actually, it's it's funny, you know, I ended up going back to church um, as a Methodist hmm. in, right, I guess about six months after I got sober. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, 
bringing my own version of God to church with me was very effective. And, and it was something I heard someone say in a meeting once. They said, you know, my pastor wants to tell me about his God, blah, 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 blah. He's like, and it's not that I don't agree with him. He's like, I just bring my own version. And I thought, wow, that's beautiful. Mm-hmm. It, you know, and, and so I do, you know, my, my faith is an important part of my life, but I don't think it's the end all be all. Mm-hmm. So um, I think meditation, I think yoga, I think spending time with nature for me, I think sitting on the beach and staring at the ocean oh, is yeah. as powerful as sitting inside of a church. Oh, yeah. Sometimes more powerful, you know? So I, I think I see God in other people. Mm-hmm. I think I saw that a lot in my early sobriety, and I still see it today. But I think that there's always this higher power that's moving things in our lives or making things possible, and it's there if you want to see it. Mm-hmm. And I think I, I, you know, I remember in the very beginning of my sobriety, standing outside and looking at the sky and saying, help me, because that was the only thing I could figure out to say. Yeah. And my higher power did help me because my higher power doesn't care how pretty my words are or how eloquent my prayers are. Um, it's the genuineness of my heart mm. that matters. Absolutely. And so, you know, I, I'm never going to be one of those people who likes to pray out loud in front of other people. I'm always just very self-conscious about that. But I know that when I'm talking to my higher power, I can say whatever. And, you know, I thank my higher power for everything from a good parking space <laughs> to a uh, sunrise every morning to mm. whatever. And I, so I, I think... I think now for me, spirituality is throughout the day. And in the beginning, I thought it had to be at a set time in a set way. Mm. And now it's just all over. Hmm. Nice. Cool. Perfect. All right. I got my last question. So you said uh, you're a mom. Um, How worried are you that uh, alcoholism or addiction is a sort of a, a genetic thing? And what do you do to educate uh, your child about like the like the dangers of like, drugs and alcohol and the the prevalence of recovery as well? Yeah. Um, so it's interesting enough. I mean, honestly, I, I do have alcoholics on both sides, aunts and uncles, my mm-hmm. parents. Um, on my mother's side of the family, up until my my last two uncles, every man for two generations had died at forty eight ages of at forty eight or younger. Oh wow! Um, yeah, I mean it's a killer disease. So um, we went back up to Massachusetts this summer. Well, I say back, but it was my first time back in a long time. And my mm-hmm. husband and my daughter came with me, and we saw some of my relatives. And I have an uncle I haven't seen in. I don't know, uh, 10 years. Mm-hmm. And he and I, he and I used to run into each other in the bars or whatever. And I was so excited to find out that we were both sober. Wow. And he had been sober longer than we had. Um, and so like just the fact that it was like, oh, okay, you know, I used to joke that I wasn't, instead of being the first one that went to college, I was the first one that got sober, but I'm not, he got sober before me. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I do worry about it because it's on both sides of my family. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I know mm-hmm. the research shows that there is a genetic link. Mm-hmm. And so, but I'm also happy about the fact that the stigma of it and the hiding of it is going away. Yeah. And so I have already started to talk to her about the fact that there is a possibility that because I am an alcoholic, there is a greater chance that she could become an alcoholic. Mm-hmm. And that when she reaches the age of drinking, she's going to have to be aware of it. And she's going to have to be conscious of it. Mm-hmm. And I've tried to explain to her things like, um, you know, and she's 11. So I start, I start slow. Yeah, but, you absolutely. know, what I'm working up to is if you start to feel like when you're drinking, you don't have control or you don't like the decisions you make when you're drinking. Or, you know, it makes you feel like it's, you know, you're not acting like yourself and you don't like how it is. Then, then those are all signs. Because I don't think anybody ever told me the sign. Yeah. I don't know that I would have listened. But nobody told me. Mm-hmm. So I'd like to arm her with that. Um, I, I like to think that I, you know, the other thing is she she is growing up in a much more healthy environment. Mm-hmm. 
So, you know, recently I got to give a lecture about um, addiction and alcoholism to a bunch of nursing students. Nice. And when I was doing the research for it, some of the studies I had pulled show that, like, of alcoholics and addicts, when they go and they ask them, more than 70% have some form of childhood trauma. Mm. Yeah. It's a huge predictor. Yeah. You know, so it's like a combination of genetics and trauma. And so, mm-hmm. you know, I'm doing what I can do to try to keep her trauma-free. Yeah. As much as I can. Mm-hmm. Um, to educate her about her genes. To talk to, I've talked to her already about peer pressure, you know, about people. I, I mean, I've been open. I'm like, hey, I've heard that, you know, there are people who have pill parties and they just dump all the pills in the in a bowl at a party and you start taking stuff. Yeah. And I've really talked to her about never taking anything if she doesn't know what it is. I'm like, I don't care if somebody tells you it's Tylenol. If you can't read the bottle, see what it is. If you feel like you're in doubt, don't take it. Yeah. Um, we've also... You know, she's at the age where now she's just starting to go to people's houses more and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we've set up with her, if you're ever at somebody's house, if you're ever whatever, you just have to call and say, I don't feel comfortable. I need you to come get me. And you don't have to give an explanation. Mm-hmm. We may talk about it later, but you don't ever have to feel like you have to ask to come home. If something in your spidey sense says, I need to get out of here, just just call, text, whatever. You know, and I've told her, I don't even care if you're just at a friend's house for a sleepover, another girl, and something doesn't feel right to you. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, I, I think I know other people's parents, but I don't, yeah. you know, you never know what happens in somebody's house until yeah. the door closes. So mm-hmm. I want her to know she has the ability to say, I don't feel comfortable and I need to get out of here. Yeah. And then lastly, um, you know, my friends joke with me about this, but so every day when I drive her to school, her and I both say five things that we're grateful for that day, and we say the serenity prayer together. And I have really tried to help her learn about the difference between the things that she can control and the things that she can't, Mm. because I I think just knowing that there's some things you just can't control and you just have to roll with them, maybe you end up with less resentment and maybe you don't have as much to drink over. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. it's 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 another thing where I try to approach it from a whole bunch of different angles. The the funny thing is, and this is another higher power thing. I think, you know, I was raised with St. Patrick's Day being like you know High Holy Day. You oh, start drinking yeah. March first and you go straight till March thirty first, mm-hmm. right? I had my daughter on St. Patrick's Day, oh, and wow. so. You know, I never think about drinking on St. Patrick's Day. I mean, I don't think about drinking anymore anyways. But mm-hmm. in those first, you know, months and stuff like that, it was such a gift for her birthday to be that day. Mm-hmm. And for that month to be all about her. Mm. That's you awesome. Know, I, I do worry that when she's 21, it'll be a whole different experience for her. <laughs> but we'll Ye- cross that bridge when we get there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right. That was awesome. Yeah, it was Got- great. All right, it was well, awesome. Yeah, we would like to uh, thank you for uh, joining us today. Golf clap, Eric. It was a golf clap. There we go. It's fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. I enjoyed it. I really did. Absolutely. And actually, we're gonna we're gonna turn it over to you for one one quick last message from you for all the addicts out there who are listening, who are struggling. Uh, what do you have to say for them? Oh, two things. One is you're absolutely worth it. And if nobody has told you that today, you are. Mm -hmm. And the second is that if I can do this, anybody can do this. Nice. Short and sweet. Perfect. Love it. All right. Well, uh, we're going to sign out real quick here. Uh, Here at Podcast Recovery, we are aiming to expand the scope of support for recovering addicts. Accessibility and convenience of helpful services is paramount to combating addiction. We work to bring the message of recovery to every addict, wherever and whenever it is needed. We believe that a powerful voice of recovery should be obtainable, practical, and at the touch of a button. Every addict deserves to hear a message of hope, and Podcast Recovery is here to provide it. Yeah, so again, thank you for joining us. Everybody, thanks for listening. Follow us on Twitter, follow us on Facebook, like, share, subscribe, invite your friends. And uh, more importantly, everybody out there, stay safe and stay clean.